I want to start by reading three sections of scripture and then we'll return to them. Uh, I, it's really short sections. They're familiar sections. I'm sort of trusting you, you know the gist of where these are going, so you don't necessarily have to follow along. But Luke 22, 33 and 34, it's the Last Supper. Jesus is sort of saying his last words, his swan song. He's giving them their last little bit before he goes to the inevitable. And Peter, hearing this, kind of says to himself, I'm, I'm not going to take that, Lord. And so he says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus sort of graciously looked back at him and told him the truth. He says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And indeed, Jesus got him. That happened. We know. And so... What did Jesus know about Peter that Peter didn't know about himself? Peter had all this desire to do something and then he couldn't follow through on what he desired. Uh, Romans, Romans 7, 15. Paul literally just articulates that. He says it really, really clearly. He says this, 7, 15. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And I'm sure that none of you in this room have ever experienced that before, right? That's for for Azusa, right? No, no, this is something for all of us. This is a dynamic that is in our lives. Then we go to Genesis 3, 8. Adam and Eve, there's the fall. Broken relationship with God. Their primary location in God's creation has been severed. And what happens? What follows? And it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Some theologians say this is the saddest verse in the whole Bible. God is reaching out to them, calling them to himself, meeting them in their familiar place. And that relationship has been severed. And they do what? They hide And so there's a progression I want to point out here. Peter, the everyman, right? He's confronted with a reality. He wants to stick with Jesus even unto death. And Jesus calls his shot and he is not able to do it. There's a sense that he can't be and do what he wants to be and do. And then that kind of extends to us. Look, if Peter can't do this, we may have desires about what we want to be. We may have great expectations. But there's a reality to our lives, isn't there? And so Paul flat out says it. He says he realizes the riddle of existence, and so he just engages honestly with God. He says it like it is, and he says, I do what I don't want to do. And of course, in Genesis, our first parents, they did the thing that they were not supposed to do. They actually went against the way they were created. And they were made for unbroken relationship with God. They were made to want to be in relationship with God. And so they did what they did. They broke that relationship. And so how did they cope with that? Adam and Eve, Peter and Paul, all of them sort of demonstrate for us that there is this phenomena. There is this ideal, there is this way that we should be. Again, great expectations. Most of us even want to be what we should be. It's not like we, when we don't do what we expect to do, it's not like we didn't want to do it. We don't do what we expect all the time, even though we wanted to. And yet there is this persistent, crippling sickness that we all have to live with. It's a reality for us. And so when we realize that we are not acting in the way we should, we actually do the same thing that our first parents did. We hide. And so tonight I want to tell you some of my story. And here's what I suspect. I suspect that my story is in part somewhat your story as well. It may not be. And I want to hold that out there too. This may not be, but I want to show you some of my story and offer that you might be able to see a piece, a part, or a lot of your story in my story. But tonight is about what our first parents did. It's about hiding. Hiding when we realize we are not living up, that reality is not 
living into our expectations. Uh, I have three kids. Uh, he mentioned it, Avery, Grant, and Noel. Um, and we love to play hide and go seek. We just, one of our favorite things to do, they just get super excited to do it. My two-year-old, Noel, is awful at it. She just has no idea really what the whole concept is. So, if you were at fives the other day, she's the one that basically puts her hands in her face and then lays in the middle of the carpet in the middle of some room <laughs> and feels like she's hiding adequately. She thinks if I can't see her, I mean, she can't see me, then I can't see her. She's awful at it. And if I don't catch her within 20 seconds, she just gives up and runs out and tries to find me. <laughs> Grant is five, and he's a little different. He's got more nuance to him. He's actually been playing the game for five years. He finds better places to hide than his little sister. He's even developed the patience to go with it. And he experiences the thrill of winning that game, which is to not be found for as long as possible. He's the one that scares me a bit. My seven-year-old is even more interesting and has some more nuance to her. She's been playing it longest. She hides, she finds pretty good places to hide as well. I actually find it pretty hard to find her sometimes. Um, she waits, but then she comes out of hiding. She sort of just gives up the whole game. And what I think she's realizing when she comes out of hiding, she just kind of emerges out of nowhere. And I just kind of say, hey, sweetie, what, what's up? I'm supposed to be looking for you. Because I know, Dad, I just want to be with you and look for the other ones. And I, and I love something about what she's doing there. She just kind of gives the game up, comes out of hiding and wants to be with Dad. For her, the excitement is coming out, holding my hand, and looking for the other ones with me. Now, I don't know if you experience the same thing I did. What I experienced when I play hide and go seek was a lot of uncomfortableness, and especially these days when I play, usually I'm like crammed under some bed somewhere and it's hot, and I can feel my breath and I'm just sweating. And what always happens when you hide? You have to pee <laughs> every time. So for me, I don't, even, I don't even like the game really. It's kind of a, what I've realized is it's uncomfortable to hide. And here's, here's part of the key. It's unsustainable too. You really can't, you can't sustain that. It's not a lifestyle hiding. I really like looking, but I don't like hiding. So like I said, tonight is about hiding and the, it's about the ways and the reasons we hide spiritually. But also tonight is about the unique ways we are tempted to hide at Biola. Remember, this is a family talk. This is after dark. This is not morning chapel. This is ours, right? I believe because I'm a two-time alumni, I've sat in your seat before. I believe that there is something unique. There's some unique ways that we hide that nobody else hides. And I want to talk about that. Tonight is about the way we look to lay aside our strategies for hiding and to, from God and to embrace our true identities in Christ, to really explore what that is. Tonight is about what it would take to pray as David prayed in Psalm 139. Search me, O God. Know my heart, try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What is David doing when he says those words? He is coming out of hiding. He's giving up the game. So I came to Biola as a junior in 1997, I don't care, I'm admitting it, I'm owning it, I'm old. I was a junior in 1997. I came out of an amazing church. I was a highly motivated believer. I had really good pastors and they helped me understand as much as I could about God. I had leadership opportunities. And in 10th grade, I taught myself how to play guitar. Started leading worship at my youth group. And I have described this as, and if you've heard this before, I, I, I've described myself as I wasn't really popular in my high school, but I ruled at my church, right? I had that guitar and I led the worship and I ruled at that church. And if a youth group could have a prom king, I'm pretty sure that was me. It's <laughs> kind of what the guitar does for you. What was awesome about this was that, hey, prom king. Um, 
I went to the local community college for two years to get my general ed out of the way, and sorry losers, I saved $40,000 doing so. <laughs> and uh, so I went to the, the junior college, and I was taking classes, and the cool thing was that my, my, my youth group that I had been a part of, I was immediately a leader in that group now. I was on staff there. I was getting all this respect from my peers, who before they were just my friends, and now they're asking me for accountability advice and everything, and they're, they're coming to me for wisdom, and they're kind of treating me like I'm their, their counselor, and these, these are like people that are eight months younger than me. And I started experiencing that amazing feedback. And so I came to Biola after grooming my spiritual leadership for six years in that youth group, each year given more respect and more leadership. And so I figured this was the right step to come here, right? You see, I had conquered one youth group, and it only made sense that I would come to a bigger one and conquer it too. In other words, the success I experienced at home, I just sort of expected it to roll over and happen once again, now on a bigger scale here at Biola. But when I got here, guess what I discovered? And, and here's where maybe our stories begin to intersect. I discovered there were 4,000 other people just like me. I wasn't special. I wasn't unique. I wasn't a spiritual standout. Nobody cared that I led worship. In fact, everybody led worship and they all played better than I did. <laughs> Nobody was asking my spiritual advice. Nobody was noticing how wise I was. And so looking back, this was so disorienting. You see, my only frame of reference was thrown off. I had grown accustomed to standing out, at, and at Biola, I, I didn't stand out at all. I don't know if any of you feel that way, but that was what my first semester here really was all about. What I know now that I didn't know then is that when I realized that I wasn't extra special or extra wise, I was in the grips of a great temptation. What temptation was that? Well, it was the original temptation of my first parents, and that was the temptation to hide. Here is what I didn't do. I didn't pray David's words. I didn't notice the pain and the confusion and, and sort of like, wow, I had all this feedback. God, what's going on? What are you teaching me? God, just show me myself right now. Just search me. God, I, I sense that you're bringing me into some new knowledge and you want to teach me something, so God, you just search me. I have no fear of condemnation before you because of Christ. I just go right to you, so search me, God. I didn't do that. I didn't say, God, be with me. Instead, I created two personas to remedy my problem. My next two years here at Biola were spent exploring two options that were designed to cope with the problem of no longer feeling like I could be really a, a spiritual competitor. My good friend Adam, he has put this dilemma this way. He says, it's sort of like a, just a premise. Premise starts this way, I'm not okay. That's the first premise. When I came to Bible, I kind of realized, I'm not a stand, I don't think I'm okay anymore. I used to think I was okay, I don't think I'm okay anymore now. So I'm not okay. Second part of the premise, someone else is okay. Look at all these other 4,000 people who, who do everything better than me. I'm not okay, someone else is okay. Third part, I need to become someone else. I'm not okay, someone else is okay. I need to become somebody else. See, this problem is Biola's uniquely. Um, takes unique form on our campus at USC, UCLA, Cal State Fullerton. When they realize that they're not fitting in, they fix that with parties, drinking, and, and promiscuity. Now, you all know that to some degree that's happening, but that's happening in secret here. That's not celebrated at all here. So we sort of take that option away from you. It's happening, but it's not happening in a way that's celebratory. It's hidden. And so there emerges a gap between our spiritual expectations for ourselves that are pretty and lofty. We want to be someone else who's better. And there's a gap between that and our reality. And so we wish to be further along. 
We wish to be better. And when we realize we are not, we hide. And so I commenced what I am from now on going to be called option A. Option A was my first attempt to deal with not being unique or good or impressive at Biola. Option A uh, involved trying harder. Option A involved getting to every inspiration, every chapel, and somehow engaging worship. I don't know if this is possible, but I thought it was harder. If you can possibly worship harder. I was trying to do it. If you were an earshot of me in those days, you might catch me using the big words I was learning in class. I would sit in the stairwells and I would debate Calvinism and Arminianism as if it had never been debated before <laughs> and that the world was coming to me for the final word. That's how I, that's, that was my posture. See, I was grooming this new way. This was option A. And for me, option A ballooned into a full-fledged strategy where I was doing more spiritual activity and projecting more and more of a spiritual persona in an attempt to capture what I I had when I was the king of the youth group. But guess what happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. What I found is that I was killing myself trying to manage this persona just to keep up with the people around me but I still wasn't getting noticed. I wasn't getting the respect. And what I started to see was that what I was doing was wrong. In fact, I was actually thinking things and resenting people in new ways. I was becoming critical. I was doing really good things and I was thinking to myself in my head, oh my gosh, those people aren't doing the good things. I'm doing the good things. I'm more involved, they're not. I was really impressed with me. I started to see how impossible this game was. And that competitive spirituality of option A, it just wasn't working for me. It wasn't producing the desired effect, and so I started to become cynical. And of course, that was the beginning of option B for me. Option A was an attempt to deal with the reality that I'm not okay, somebody else is okay, I need to be somebody else. Option A was my first attempt to solve that problem. And so I became somebody else to deal with the harsh reality that I was not smarter, that I was not funnier, that I wasn't more attractive, that I wasn't more talented, that I wasn't more successful, that I wasn't generally more celebrated than I was. And so I hid and I covered the reality by trying to appear more self-controlled, more patient, kinder, more loving, more effective in ministry, wiser, more at peace, more content, more admired for my goodness. See, option A had utterly failed me. And so with Peter and Paul, I wanted to be better, but I just couldn't do it. And with Adam and Eve, I coped by hiding behind option A. Simon Tugwell says this in his book, The Beatitudes. And so, like runaway slaves, we either flee our own reality or manufacture a false self, which is mostly admirable mildly prepossessing and superficially happy. We hide what we know or feel ourselves to be, which assumes to be unacceptable or unlovable. We hide that behind some kind of appearance which we hope will be more pleasing. We hide behind pretty faces which we put on for the benefit of our public. And in time, we may even come to forget that we are hiding. Think about that. And think that our assumed pretty faces is what we really look like. This is the dilemma of pretty expectations and reality. Now, I I suspect this. I'm not saying this is absolutely what happens to every person. Here's what I'm confident about. There are people in here who have no idea what I'm talking about. But here's something else I'm confident about. There are people in here who know exactly what I'm talking about. So, I suspect that several of you had this experience. You look inside and you see that you fall short and you compare yourself like crazy to other people. And so you see that you fall short and so you, you start doing, whether you know it or not, is you start manufacturing a false self. 
And for some of you, you've done this for so long that you finally f- just forget what you're doing. But when some of you do see that you, what, what's going on, it's painful to see yourself. It's painful. Self-awareness is hard. When you see a hidden motivation for something that you've been doing for a long time and you see that it's got a shadow side, it looks good, but man, that thing has a big shadow. It's not fun. It's difficult. Self-awareness is potentially hugely painful. And so I kicked off the carefully crafted option B. And again, this was just a way of me dealing with the pain of self-awareness. Option B emerged because it was easier to notice that other people were frauds right along with me. You know, when you're going down, it's easier to go down with other people. I knew that I was kind of a fraud, but I would rather spend my time looking at everybody else who's a fraud because I hate looking at myself. Option B was way more cynical. In option B, I had the right to judge and critique my classmates who appeared to be struggling right along with me and coping with what appeared to be option A. They seemed to be trying to worship harder just like I used to be doing, and they were talking spiritual too. If you went to a Monday chapel a couple of weeks ago, Murray Decker told a story about me when he knew me when I was deep in option B. Um, See, in option B, I, I reserved the right to smash everybody else's sandcastle, right? Because mine had been smashed, and so I felt I needed to do the work of smashing everybody else's before they got there. And so there was this guy who was playing guitar right out in front of Alpha. <laughs> so, oh, oh, why do you laugh? You know this guy. He still goes here, apparently. <laughs> Just leading a little impromptu worship sesh, you know? Right in front of Al- Alpha, right when... You know, hundreds of girls are going back to their room, right? And well, at this point, I was his RA, and I just thought to myself, man, option B, this is my responsibility, right? I got to take responsibility for this kid. So I walked up to him, and I just took his guitar and said, we don't do that here. I took, took it away. Kind of a jerk. Um, in many ways, oh, come on, you guys, no girl is impressed. Maybe I have a little option B still in me. (laughs) In many ways, option B felt way more gratifying than option A. I mean, it felt good at times to be able to expose, pull back the curtain and everything. But you know what? I, I eventually realized here too, with the help of some really, really good spiritual guides, option B served the same purpose for me as option A. Option B, like option A, was just a bad way to cope with the gap between expectations and reality. The spiritual performance of option A was not dealing with my inability to measure up. And the cynicism of option B wasn't dealing with it either. I just became progressively more and more bitter. Realizing that neither option was adequately dealing with the gap between expectations and reality Man, I hit a new low. I mean, I literally despaired. I, di- I didn't know what to do now. I was out of options, literally at the end of my rope. Now, again, I suspect some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not establishing a law or a rule that always happens. I'm sharing my story, but I'm offering my story just in case some of you see yourself in it. I suspect that this is a journey that many of us at Biola need to live all the way through. Many of you have embraced one or both of these options. You know what, there, there's more options too. There's lots of ways to hide. Jesus said these words that toward the end of my time at Bible, I, I really did not understand. He, he said this, he said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Your yoke is easy, Jesus? Okay, first of all, I don't really even understand what a yoke is. Right? But if that means your burden is light, really? I mean, I'm sweating it out over here. I, I, I'm, I'm figuring out option A. I'm implementing option A. I'm seeing that option A doesn't work anymore. I've become cynical. I'm now I'm grooming option B. 
You know, I'm future planning on other options here, God. Your yoke is easy, your burden is light. Man, I'm, I'm, sw- I'm doing a lot here. I identify option A and option B because I believe that these struggles take unique shape among us, like I've said a few times. Thank God in the years um, since I was an undergraduate at Biola, I've learned about something I'll just, I'll call option C. Option C is much less manic, much less busy, way less frustrated, way less cynical. Option C is marked by the feeling of giving up the game altogether. Option C is that moment where you come out of hiding. That's when you realize that hiding is unsustainable, uncomfortable, unmanageable. When you realize when you're cramped under some bed somewhere and you're sweaty and you have to pee and you say to yourself, finally, this isn't the way I was made. I wasn't made to do this. I wasn't made to crouch under some bed and hide like this. It's the moment when sweaty, you get out of your hiding spot and you just emerge. So where's dad? Where's dad? Option C is my seven-year-old giving up the game in favor of holding my hand. Option C stands against option A and B and any other options that we can think of. Brennan Manning reminds us that Jesus advocates option C. Speaking for Jesus, Brennan says, come to me now. Acknowledge and accept who I want to be for you. A savior of boundless compassion, infinite patience, unbearable forgiveness and love that keeps no score of wrongs. Love that keeps no score of wrongs. So remember when I got to Biola and I just got on campus and I realized there's 4,000 other people and I just kept sort of keeping score? Wait, wait, there's no score? Love that keeps no score of wrongs. Jesus says to us, quit projecting onto me your own feelings about yourself Don't put that on me. At this moment, your life is a bruised reed and I will not crush it, a smoldering wick and I will not quench it. You are in a safe place. And so we we get to emerge out of hiding. Many of you are hiding maybe right now. Um, You believe that God can't find you if you tell him all the hard work you've been doing for him, maybe you've just got so much in your life that you're doing, and you're doing so much of that to sort of, God, don't look at my bad. Don't, don't look at that stuff over there. Look at this stuff, the shiny stuff. Maybe you have huge expectations for your life here at Biola. I remember when I got accepted to Biola, I, I was going through a rough breakup and things were kind of looking bad. And I remember feeling like, hallelujah, I'm getting into Biola. I'm going to go to the place where they're going to tell me how to figure it all out and get it all right. And then I'm going to nail down my life and hold it in my hand. and I'm going to have it. And man, was God so interested in disrupting that view of Biola. But you know what, you, you maybe are like my two-year-old. Maybe you're putting your hands in your face and you're hiding and you're thinking, you know what? If I can't see God, maybe he can't see me. And you know, that's just not true. Hiding is a ridiculous strategy. Others of you are hiding from God because maybe you've given up altogether. There are those of you in here who are more cynical. I've been to a lot of these. And kind of started hoping that maybe one would do it. And after a while, you kind of start going, I, don't, I just don't think so. I don't think it's going to happen for me. And it's not that you're not a believer anymore, but you just don't really get it anymore. 
You know what, there's good news for people who are engaging in both options, and, and all the options. The gospel is still, after all, good news. There is option C, where we give up, we come out of hiding, we stop trying to impress God with either our works or our cynicism and our smarts. We come out of hiding, we join God, and we simply grab his hand. And that starts when we pray these phenomenal words with David. Just close your eyes right now. I'm going to pray these words. And just, wherever you are, whatever option, I'm, there are other options, whatever option you're, you're, you're maybe engaged in right now, just lead in obedience as you hear these words and let this be the prayer of your heart. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, O oh God. God, would you search us right now? We are so prone to wander, so prone to leave you, so prone to leave the God we love. God, we can't hide from you. We figure out phenomenal ways to hide. We construct new ways to do it, but you know what, God? We want to come out of hiding. Would you search us? Would you confront us? We pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.